Hello Rachel, congratulations to your 250 subscribers. At this point it's probably even some more. Now I had seen your video uh, concerning uh, three tasks or questions and um, yes I felt drawn to contribute something. At the same time I was a bit wary and maybe a little bit doubtful about my ability to contribute. Uh, first of all Usually these contests are much easier for me because I'm uh, functioning well as this kind of an electric monkey with symbols. Um, you ask me to put up three records that are all red, it's no problem. You ask me to put up five records with the same bass player, no problem. But this here it's a bit different, it's about um, telling stories and about uh, things that may have emotional impacts or some fuzzy stuff like that. So um, it took me some thinking. Also your first question is quite special and uh, I wasn't... at first I didn't think I have anything, anything to contribute to that. But it stuck with me for a while and like two hours later I thought, hmm, yeah, actually there was this one incident and uh, suddenly I remembered something else. I said, oh, but so in the end I ended up with three spots, three magical power spots uh, that are kind of a crossroad in rock and roll history and uh, that uh, have something to do with me or my past. So I thought, all right, now I now rem remember those, so I think I can do it now. So um, let's begin. Now the first of these three um, places I want to mention. Um, oh, and by the way, some of the some of the stuff I found photographs, so I will pull them up uh, later in the in the when I'm editing the video. Um, so uh, it will not be entirely boring just looking at my face. Um, so spot number one, and that's an easy one, and uh, not that unique or in any way special but um, since I'm living in Germany um, I had spent quite some time in the north in the famous city of Hamburg. Now if you are in Hamburg and you are strolling through the famous Reeperbahn um, and coming across this uh, huge uh, street called Große Freiheit it's quite obvious that you end up uh, in front of this place and spot that once was the Star Club. The Star Club where the Beatles not only have played but had a residency. And uh, so this is certainly a place I have seen. Um, obviously the Star Club came out of existence in 1969 as far as I remember and was replaced by a strip joint called Salambo. And, um, um, sorry, just have a sip of coffee here. Um, mm, obviously, there is kind of a plague placed there at this spot where the entry to the Star Club was. So, um, that's what I've seen. Yeah, um, spot number two. This was actually a year ago. I was a year ago, I was in London to attend. A concert by Dead Can Dance in the Hammersmith Odeon and uh, yeah so I spent most of the time here in uh, Shepherd's Bush. Here's a photograph of me in Shepherd's Bush, um, White City. So this is basically kind of Pete Townsend's corner of London and uh, here is me in front of uh, the Hammersmith um, however, um, another interesting spot uh, is uh, kind of in the inner city where the Polytechnic is. Uh, here it is uh, in the Regent Street. There is this interesting Pink Floyd plaque um, showing that uh, Nick Mason, Roger Waters and Richard Wright studied here between 1962 and 1966. So uh, that's kind of nice. But that's not the place of my pilgrimage. My pilgrimage went uh, in Soho to 100 Water Street. Now in 19 Water Street, at 19 Water Street was the famous Marquis Club ran by John G. Immortalized in a Jethro Tull song. 
And uh, the Marquee Club didn't, as far as I know, did not have proper uh, sort of alcohol license. So this was a place to go and see a band, um, but the musicians didn't hang there after the concert. Uh, but they went to a place that was only like 20 steps away, basically, at 100 Water Street. Um, this was a small club called La Chaise, La Chaise uh, run by Jack Barry. And uh, Jack Barry later became the manager of the Marquis Club as well. But he had this little club since May 1967. And uh, this was quite uh, an exclusive place, not in a sense of being a expensive place. It was exclusive in the sense that usually you only came in if John Barry knew you or liked you or, or uh, you were somewhat connected to the whole bunch of these kind of London-based musicians. So um, Jake Barry was a friend with a singer called John Anderson, who at this point in time had returned from Germany so he was he had been member of a band with his brother of a band called Warriors and it kind of fell apart so he was a bit disillusioned and uh, helped him with uh, serving the drinks and cleaning the tables and stuff like that and earning little money that way and Jack Barry made him acquainted with a guy sitting at the end of the bar whose name was Chris Squire and that's how Yes came to existence so when I was in London I thought like all right I have to go to 100 Water Street and uh just pay my homage. Um, obviously today there is nothing left of uh, the La Chasse Club. Um, this today at 100 Water Street, as you can see in this photograph of me again, um, there is a kind of a fancy, fancy restaurant there and uh, it's all a bit boring of course, uh, but it's also 50 years later. So what can you expect? Now this was spot number two. Now spot number three is a little more, a little more of a, a cute, intimate story that needs a bit of explaining. So uh, this will take us to Munich, München, Germany. And uh, I had lived many years in Munich and I moved to Munich when I was 18. This was 1989. And uh, I came from basically countryside and was totally wide-eyed fascinated by the big city lights and um, I was lucky I'm old enough now to say that I was lucky to have experienced the old Munich that just does not exist exist anymore these days I mean today Munich has become this highly efficient highly boring city that constantly suffers the lack of creativity and uh, is only a shadow of the city it once was in those other times, I mean, I'm talking late 60s, 70s, 80s, Munich was highly magnetic to creative people, to writers, to poets, to musicians. Um, this is one of the pillars where the disco fever had started with Giorgio Moroda and Donna Summer had lived there and Jura Heap had recorded their albums. There's this, there was something about Munich. In those days, I was a bit of a goth kid. So, uh, I was heavily into New Wave and Gothic and stuff like that and this was happening in days when these words actually meant something. And uh, the one thing I have easily learned from this kind of a subculture, this kind of an environment, was to become quite unconcerned, unconcerned about people's sexual identity. Because once, once you are part of a scene where almost half of the people are gay or trans something oftentimes it was not even easy to kind of identify what it was all about it was just about being being playful being exploring yourself we all had been uh, putting makeup on our faces and uh, quite careless or quite quite ignorant about conventional or conservative ideas of male and female so this was kind of good because it made me just used to basically anything you could throw at me. So um, this has never left me again and it's certainly something that has enriched my, my view, my uh, observation of the world. So in those days I was hanging around gay bars quite a lot. 
and uh, this sounds more adventurous <laughs> than it was. But I had a very good friend from Hamburg. He was living in Munich too at that point in time. He was a um, he was a movie or film projectionist. He was working in in a rather dusty old traditional cinema. This is before all the Cinemaplex madness started. He was working. He was working in this one famous cinema that even came into the Guinness Book of Records as being the one cinema that shown at least at this point in time in the early 90s that had been showing the Rocky Horror Picture Show the most times in history. So I was once there actually just for fun and uh, surrounded by people dressed up in these costumes throwing popcorn at the screen and stuff like that and Man, the the real the film copy was really banked up from all these showing. This looked like a movie from the twenties or something. <laughs> However, um, this is not the story I want to tell. The point is, we have been we have been uh, hanging around a lot in, in 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 gay pubs and gay bars because at this point in time, it was really a good place to be. The music was excellent, and uh, um, it it was just place where you could uh, just talk a lot. The atmosphere was very positive because I mean at the same time you had a lot of clubs in Munich that were all kind of you know straight testosterone filled and this was a rather for us a rather annoying place to go and we preferred to be in, in those places. And by the way you could meet a lot of interesting women there that were going to gay bars for exactly the same reason. So they would be left alone by the wrong men. Uh, so um, we kind of enjoyed our time there, and uh, um, nobody cared. I mean, this was this was not a big deal. It's not like people came to me and said, "You know what? If you want to stay here, you have to hit the dark room once in a while." Nothing like that ever happened. Um, but um, I remember this buddy of mine and me. We uh, came across this little little spot um, which was called Millord or Mylord in the Ickstadtstraße. And this was in the heart of this little quarter called Glockenbachviertel, which has this really high density of, of, of gay pubs and gay bars. And we looked to inside through the windows and thought, hey, let's go in and just let's have a have a beer. Well, he was drinking beer, I think. I never I never drank much alcohol, so I was just the guy to drink to drink a apple juice <laughs> or something. So we went inside and it was a very calm place and a very small place. There were like only five tables there. And all but one table were occupied and guys were sitting there and the music was not very loud so everybody was talking really calm and almost whispering and um, we quickly found out that the place was ran by an older lady whose name was Marietta and uh, I mean she looked at us from head to toe and um, she immediately was able to look through us and uh, she was like yeah I know you don't belong here but never mind if you want to stay for a beer or two I don't care so um, yeah we sat down we were really uh, two nice uh, courteous blokes so um, we would make no problem so yeah she brought us the drinks and we've been talking for a while and after a while uh, she came back this Marietta and uh, she looked at me and said you know it's okay that you sit here, but I thought you should know that this chair you're sitting on, this was Freddy's chair, this is where Freddy was sitting. And I was like, oh, okay, oh, all right, yes. Uh, after she went away, I just looked over my shoulder and there was this wall filled with photographs, uh, most of them showing Freddie Mercury. And uh, this was kind of his spot, this is the place where he was going. He uh, celebrated his birthday there and he organized a kind of a mask ball, kind of a Halloween type of party there. And uh, yeah, so I spent a whole evening sitting in Freddie Mercury's chair in a tiny little gay club in Munich. So in that sense, yeah, I sat in Mr. Bad Guy's chair for an evening. So uh, this is... Uh, this is uh, my answer to question number one. Um, by the way, the, the, the Millard's place does not exist anymore. Um, I remember many years later I was working in a, in a PR company that had their office basically across, across the street. And uh, so I could see that the place was already gone. So I think this is a bit of a Munich uh, Glockenbachviertel history.
Um, I the only thing I have as a memorabilia from this experience was this little program I took with me. I have made a scan here. Um, this was like a weekly program, and as you can see, at this point in time, this was this place was already running for 32 years. So she must have started somewhat in the mid 60s, maybe. Um, so uh, I doubt that uh, Marietta is still alive. Yeah, so this was my answer to question number one. Pretty long-winded answer again. I did it again. So um, the second question is much easier for me, much easier, because you are asking about the name of the channel. But uh, that's where I'm pretty boring, because my channel is just my name, so I'm, my name is really Alesh Picard, and um, I never chose anything fancy or playful for my channel. It probably had to do with the fact that uh, at this point, when I started, three years ago when I started um, my YouTube channel, I had already been published as an author, um, so it kind of made sense to me to um, not use any kind of uh, handle or nickname and to kind of stay simple. Um, so I, can, I cannot give any kind of exciting, fascinating insight over this. Uh, my name, my name, by the way, people always think it's a French name, and I certainly kind of uh, gravitate towards a French pronunciation, Picard, a little bit like the captain. But uh, ironically, um, the name comes from my grandfather, who um, came to Czechoslovakia in 1945 from the Ukraine. So uh, I was always... During my childhood, I was always known as the guy that is one quarter Ukrainian. Um, but ironically, my grandfather was not a real Ukrainian. He was a Carpathian Ruthenian. Now, Carpathian Ruthenia or Rusinia is a sort of a Slavic minor minority within uh, the, the Ukraine. Uh, this very wild part of uh, sort of Central Europe, Eastern Europe. Um, I was once there as a child in 1977, I think. It's a pretty interesting place. So um, my grandfather, Ikana, came with the Red Army uh, during the Second World War to Prague as part of the Liberation Forces. And, um, he had fought Hitler on the famous Dukla Pass, which was a rather dramatic giant battle that took over two or three weeks so quite quite insane um, but when he was in Prague uh, he tweaked a little bit his name in the papers and uh, remained to stay there because he was not too he was not too keen re on returning back to the Soviet Union to the Stalinist Soviet Union at this point and uh, he kind of thought he's, he's better off staying in Czechoslovakia uh, which Probably to some extent was a pretty good choice. Um, so uh, this is where this name comes from, and it's not even 100% the same name as his father had because my grandfather is slightly changed it, uh, and uh, partic particularly to make it easier to make it more pronounceable because uh, it was not that easily pronounced in Czech, and uh, so um, he created this kind of name that almost sounds French, but is not. My first name, Alesh, is a rather typical Czech name, which doesn't mean anything different than Alex just in Czech. So that's uh, kind of the um, my second answer. But it's quite fascinating because you, you speak so much about genealogy and uh, I'm, I'm uh, really a problematic case in terms of genealogy. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like a bottle filled with color that somebody threw against the wall because it's just one big chaotic splash. <laughs> I, I know nothing, nothing about my ancestors. This is all in the fog of history for me. So uh, third question. Now the third question, interesting. Uh, the, the exact wording of the question is uh, show and discuss a song, a lyric, a melody that you consider to be beautiful. 
well, so many choices here uh, that I really didn't know where to turn first. First I thought maybe I should do something with the uh, Death Can Dance, obviously. Mm. But then <coughs> I remembered one rather beautiful song um, that you can find on this album, Stormwatch by Jethro Tull. And I always felt that um, Ian Anderson is an exceptional, amazing uh, lyricist and uh, I always enjoyed his kind of uh, observational lyrics. And uh, despite the fact that uh, I always felt that um, there are some aspects of him as a person, as a as a lyricist that are highly uh, conservative and um, certainly uh, on the political spectrum, so to speak, um, probably further right from myself, but uh, not that I do too, care too much about those things. But that always made it, made it uh, an interesting challenge for me, so I always enjoyed Jethro Tull lyrics, particularly uh, from, let's say, 1976 onward. Uh, I think he really came to form like in the late 70s, early 80s. I mean, those are really the, his best lyrics. Um, yeah, so the song I'm talking about is called Orion. And I always felt that this is a beautiful example of a multi-layered kind of existential, observational poetry. And a quite a fascinating song. And uh, so um, this is uh, what I have picked. What certainly isn't interesting about this song is that it has a certain dreamy romantic notion in some parts where it feels very detached but it keeps at the same time it keeps slipping into this world of rather existential impressions of uh, of a real life and it's really oozing oozing the the feeling of real life between the lines of the lyrics so yeah, the first verse is uh, just saying your faithful dog shines brighter than its lord and master. Your jeweled sword twinkles as the world rolls by. Which is obviously just a very romantic description of the Orion star constellation. Um, so come up singing above the cloudy cover. Stare through at people who toss fitful in their sleep. So um, there's sort of this closer look through an open window into people's private life. I know you are watching as the old gent by the station scuffs his toes on old fag packets lying in the street. Is this a reference to Aqualung once again? <laughs> and silver shadows flick across the closing bistro. Sweet waiters link their arms and patter down the street. Their words lost blowing on cold winds in darkest Chelsea. Prime years fly fading with each young heart's beat. Well, probably one has to reach a certain age to appreciate and uh, understand the meaning of these words. Finally, the last verse uh, is even more sad than that. And the young girls shiver as they wait by lonely bus stops after sad parties, no one to take them home. To greasy bad sitters and make a late night play for lost virginity a thousand miles away. Yeah, so uh, this is what I call really good rock lyrics and a very tasteful song with a lot of meaning and a lot of impression resonating through the lines. So, I've been talking for such a long time, uh, uh, probably overstretch everyone's patience again. So, um, this is my contribution and um, have a nice day and um, I'm looking forward uh, to your next video. Goodbye.